Welcome to this, this panel session. My name is Jean Lambert. I'm the Green Party member of the European Parliament for London. And within that um, role, one of the things that um, I do is I chair the delegation for South Asia, which was one of the reasons we're quite interested in looking at a sort of wider um, perspective in this particular panel on climate change today. And our original idea had would have been that we would have somebody who would come and speak about the scientific side, um, somebody who would speak about the, the political sort of negotiations, and one who would speak from the, sort of the activist perspective, trying to make the political ones take account of the science. That was the um, original sort of thinking of it. In ahead of, as we were hearing yesterday in Natalie's speech about the, the the summit meeting being called next um, in a couple of weeks' time by Ban Ki-moon, New York, ahead of the Conference of the Parties round about um, Kyoto in uh, Lima in Peru in December this year, and of course leading up to what is supposed to be the culmination of this latest round of negotiations at the Conference of the Parties number 21 um, in Paris in December next year. And the idea was, you know, hoping to come forward by then. Um, with a successor to the Kyoto Protocol. However, our scientific expert, Dr. Sunil Huck, has been delayed en route from Bangladesh to Bonn, so won't be in Birmingham um, today. So he's sent his apologies. We hope to maybe sort of link up with him another way. That wasn't possible. But we have um, dug out the video, uh, which is available on YouTube, and who knows, we might even work some magic with it later on today. Um, of a speech that he gave to a big meeting that we hosted in London a couple of years back, looking at um, climate change, and at that point in particular, Bangladesh. So, you know, despite all the best efforts, Dr. Hook and my staff trying to sort of see what would work, um, the bad news is we don't have him. On the other hand, the good news is that that gives us more time for the other two excellent speakers that we have with us today. Um, His Excellency, Excellency uh, Roberto Calzadilla, uh, the name is misspelled in the program and probably mispronounced by me in my introduction, um, who's currently the ambassador of the plurinational state of Bolivia to the Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. And also Donna Hume with us, who's the climate and energy campaigner from Friends of the Earth. We've, I'll say a, just a couple of words about um, one or two things happening at the European um, level at the moment before we hear from people who really know what they're talking about. Um, that we've been looking at the sort of the targets that the European um, Union's been proposing uh, on the table: 30% cut in emissions by 30 by not 3030, 30, it'll probably get around to that, 2030, um, 40% uh, you, you know, increase in energy efficiency, uh, 27% um, target on renewables, no national targets, you, you know, everybody just does what they can. Um, and it's certainly not in line with the EU's 2050 targets. So that's a task for the new green group to see what we can manage to do there. Um, what was it, Greens about you know, optimistic, visionary, um, and successful at times, where the discussions are underway at the moment about the, the new commission. Um, you'll have seen uh, that we now have President from Luxembourg, um, uh, President uh, Juncker, and this week we were seeing some initial sort of outlines of who might get what jobs in the new commission. Um, there was a proposal it was from a leak, so you never quite know whether that's a, you know, really just a testing of opinion, of putting together the climate change portfolio with the energy portfolio, and those both going to um, Lord Hill, of whom so many, when the British government appointed him, said, who? Um, but, uh, you, you know, there. Uh, I had a meeting with him this week before I even knew his name was in the in the running and was saying to him, well, the Greens aren't supporting any commission that's not going to be ambitious on climate change. So um, anyway, we'll see how that ends up with the commission. We've got a new president of council with the um, current uh, prime minister from Poland, um, not known, I think, for their ambition on climate change um, reductions. In fact, he reshuffled his cabinet during the last big conference in Warsaw, which the Poles were chairing, 
and reshuffled his cabinet and removed the environment minister from post. So that really looked, um, well, there are many things that it looked. I'm sure you can find your own sort of complimentary adjective to finish that sentence. So, you know, I think we, we have questions at the moment with the European Union about where all this is going with some of the discussions as well about energy security. And so we're looking at sort of, well, where are the, where are the champions? Where are the champions for ambitious action uh, on climate? So, Donna, you work on these issues in the UK. You're linked in with what's happening at the European Union. Do you want to take to the podium and give us your take on what you think is happening and, more importantly, maybe what should be happening? <laughs> Thank you, Donna. Thank you. So first of all, thank you very much for inviting me to speak today. Um, it's a privilege to be with so many people who care as passionately about climate change as I do. It's not the case every day. One thing that's clear about climate change is that it's already here. Ice is melting at the poles and on mountain glaciers across the world faster than ever before. Fossil fuels are causing sea levels to rise, magnifying climate extremes. Last year alone, 32 million people were displaced by storms and floods, almost all of which were caused by climate change. And climate change came home to, home to Britain last year too, um, with the winter floods that devastated thousands. Yet, as the realities of climate change finally begin to hit in the West, there are signs, unbelievably, that rich countries are gearing up to abandon their pledge to keep global warming under two degrees. That would be a death sentence for millions. So I want to talk to you about three things today and then end in that context on a reason to be cheerful. Firstly, how did we get to this point? Because if we don't understand the past, then we can't hope to change the future. Secondly, what should we as citizens be calling on Britain and the EU to do to deliver on their obligations to stay well below two degrees of global warming? And thirdly, what can all of us in this room do to help make that happen? But first, I just wanted to take a brief moment to tell you about Friends of the Earth. Some of you here today may know that we are a global and a local campaigning organisation with sister organisations in 78 countries worldwide and 200 local groups across England, Wales and Northern Ireland. We mobilise tens of thousands of people in Britain and millions worldwide for sustainable development. We are for justice for all within the environmental limits of our planet because we firmly believe that the environment is for everyone. And I think it's our commitment to justice that can make us powerful. Because unless we campaign for environmental solutions that will make a better world for everyone, we cannot hope to build the unity that we need so desperately to tackle climate change. So first of all, how did we get here? Why has so little progress been made in the West to reduce our carbon emissions? We know that it's not a lack of solutions. The technology exists for us to be powered by green energy. Barely a day goes by where I don't see some story about another clean tech innovation, whether it's solar roads, um, see-through glass solar panels, or, or, or who knows what else. And we've known for years that acting to stop climate change is cheaper than dealing with the costs than if we <laughs> fail to act. So it's a question of political will. And as Jean was just outlining, in the West, that has been sadly lacking. I want to just give you a little example which I think is illustrative. The following words are from an official assessment published by the government last year of the risk, risks posed by climate change to the British national interest. The following is a passage from that document which reads word for word, although the melting of Arctic sea ice could have long-term implications for the UK's climate and may damage the Arctic's biodiversity, one potential positive outcome could be the opening up of new shipping routes to Asia and the Pacific. These offer the potential for shorter journey times, lower fuel costs and savings in Suez and Panama Canal transit fees. Yes, that is what it says. You can see the same complacency in the Tories' economic strategy to, in the words of George, Os George Osborne, extract every last drop of fossil fuels from beneath our soil and it is reflected in the crippling lack of ambition in the EU's climate negotiations ahead of Paris. At the moment, EU states are debating whether, by 2030, they should cut carbon by around 30% or 
or maybe 40%. In Britain, we're saying 50, but with 10% offsetting, so it, it's, it's 40, really. And we're told that that is ambitious. But according to the renowned climate scientist, Kevin Anderson, more than double that amount is needed. If you were to take the rest of the world's global carbon budget, that which we can safely afford to emit and still have a good chance of staying under two degrees and divide it equally per population between countries, according to population between countries, then the EU would need to cut its emissions by 83% by 2030. 40% doesn't sound so ambitious anymore. And that 83% figure doesn't even take into account the vastly different contributions that countries have made to climate change so far. Despite our small size, there are only a few nations that have emitted more carbon between the Industrial Revolution and now than Britain. And other than Luxembourg, we have produced more carbon emissions per person over that period than any other country. Even more, though only just, than the United States. But instead of accepting this responsibility, under this government, the UK has been the main blockers of binding energy efficiency and renewable energy targets at an EU level. And these targets are essential to drive action. So why is this the case? The fact is that there are powerful vested interests intent on the status quo. Europe's 10 biggest energy companies have been clubbing together to lobby against green energy targets and for removing support for renewable energy, claiming that it damages competition. And there's no surprise as to why. The truth is there is more profit to be made from ever increasing fossil fuel prices than renewable energy. They, tell, they talk a lot in the media about expensive subsidies for wind turbines, but they do forget to mention the part that after you build them, they tend to run for free. And then there's the issue of stranded assets. If we are to stay within two degrees of global warming, a maximum of a quarter of known fossil fuel reserve can be burned. It's known as a carbon bubble. These are the reserves already owned, bought and sold. It doesn't even begin to count uh, energy from sources like fracking. According to Carbon Tracker, this would mean companies listed in the world top stock markets having to write off two thirds of their fossil fuel assets. Probably not a popular move in the city of London. And if you need any illustration of the love in between government and the fossil fuel industry, you need to look no further than George Osborne's father-in-law, Lord Desolate North Howell. But before I get to what we can possibly do about this, I want to talk about what we as citizens need to be asking of Britain and Europe. There is no other solution than a global agreement. Commitment to a binding and equitable agreement to keep us under, and ideally well under, two degrees is essential. The move to voluntary pledges led by the US, where each country commits essentially to what it feels like and hopes it adds up, is a setting of course for climate disaster. And on the road to Paris, the EU needs to commit to much more ambitious binding targets for carbon, renewable energy, and energy efficiency. I think the most important thing that we can do is to stop the UK being a block on a good EU deal. And I think the best way to do that is to change what our country is doing at home and to change the politics. A government whose economic strategy is to get every last drop of fossil fuels out of the ground and whose manifesto pledge is to ban offshore wind, uh, onshore wind farms is not going to support ambitious and carbon and clean energy targets. And that's why we're working with environmental and social movements across the world calling for what's known as the people en people's energy demands in the run-up to Paris. These are demands for real ambitious action on the ground. And they are, firstly, a ban on new dirty energy projects, including an end to fracking. Secondly, an end to fossil fuel subsidies. And thirdly, support for green and community energy. Paris is a major battle and it is crucial, but we will not get a global deal unless we fight and win policies that mean we are already getting off fossil fuels. And I think it's very important to say that this has to be done in a fair and just way. We need to remember that 1.3 billion people worldwide don't have access to energy. There is a legitimate need for countries other than us to, for the resources to end poverty. And that means that those that cause the crisis need to pay for it. And at the moment, they're not. Even the paltry 100 billion climate finance pledged by rich countries has failed to materialize. It has come out of existing aid, bu aid budgets. There is no extra money. So what do these people's energy demands mean for Britain in the next year in the run-up to a general election? 
Well, Friends of the Earth is calling on all parties to commit to the following as the crucial next steps to tackling climate change. Firstly, an immediate moratorium on fracking and all unconventional oil, gas and coal exploration. Secondly, an end to fossil fuel tax breaks and, uh, and subsidies for, uh, for fossil fuel production. Last year, George Osborne handed out £2.7 billion in tax breaks to fossil fuel companies. That's compared to £3.1 billion in support for renewable energy, in case you're interested. Um, and thirdly, we need to decarbonise the power sector. So we need to set a target for clean power. We need to phase out coal within the next 10 years. And we need to commit to proper funding for renewables. At the moment, we're really suffering with renewable energy companies leaving, shutting down, cancelling investments, because the funding and the policy picture is just not secure. And finally, we need a real push on energy efficiency. We're calling on all parties to launch a national energy efficiency programme in order to insulate at least one million homes a year. We're spending on average £250 heating the air outside of us as well as the planet which is ridiculous when so many people are struggling with bills. So what's our strategy to achieve all of that? I'm sure a lot of you have already done a lot to contribute to these goals already. But I think as an environment movement, we should admit that we've made some mistakes. Firstly, we talk often in jargon, in targets, in numbers, in degrees. I've just done some more of that myself. And that's why I think we need to talk about real impacts on people and real action that needs to be taken. Stopping fracking and closing coal power stations are far more concrete. And second, which is a related point, I think we have spent too long trying to convince politicians to accept inadequate policies rather than getting people to champion the, po the action that's needed. Politics is about power, and at the moment it's clear in Britain we don't have enough of it. We don't have millions of pounds at our disposal like the fossil fuel industry, but we do have billions of people in whose interest it is to stop climate change. So our aim is to unite all progressive people between, behind the action that is needed. And we need to link people in the north with countries in the south, like Bolivia, who are calling for bold climate action. Over the next year, that will mean giving our solidarity to countries calling for fair and just global climate deal. It will mean urging our own governments to pay for the crisis they have caused. As the late President Chavez of Venezuela famously said in Copenhagen, if the climate were a bank, it would already have been saved. But it will also mean... <laughs> <laughs> but it will also mean standing with people in Lancashire and everywhere else in the country that is faced with fracking. The frackers are already on the back foot, with fracking applications being turned down in the southeast. Every one of us should be proud that there has been no fracking in this country now for three years, despite the government's best efforts. But in November, Lancashire decides, and they are under a lot of pressure and are being told that it will bring many, many jobs. We know that it's not true. And every flyer handed out, every public meeting held, every letter to the local paper will help. I urge everyone who can to join groups in Lancashire in the run-up to that crucial decision and spend a day there if you can. It will mean campaigning for renewable energy in our communities. Too long the media has tried to say that people don't like green energy and it's just not true. Polling consistently shows that between 60 and 80% of people want more of it and guess what, every time people will choose wind turbines over fracking sites next to their home. Friends of the Earth's Run on Sun campaign aims to make it easier to get communities to run on solar, and starting with our schools. The average school could save £8,000 a year on their energy bills if they installed solar panels, but at the moment they're not allowed to borrow, so they lack the capital that's required. We want to make it easier for schools to go solar. But we also want to make it easier for councils, local businesses and cooperatives to generate energy which they should be able to sell to local people at reduced rates because it doesn't need to be transported all over the country. If we can change the rules so that you could do this, the more local green energy produced could mean lower bills for local people. Imagine how much that would transform the situation. <laughs> so 
So Friends of the Earth groups across the country are out getting support for this. They are asking MPs, PPCs, councillors, and anything you can do to join them will help. It will also mean backing the call for energy saving. The Energy Belt Revolution Coalition, which now has more than 200 organisations, including health groups, child poverty groups, and others, are organising a Cold Homes Week in February, a week of action where they are asking for the government to use the money from carbon taxes and reinvest that in a programme of energy efficiency in order that people can stop struggling with their bills and we can stop wasting money and contributing to the climate crisis. I believe that if we work together on all of these things, we can have a real chance of averting the worst of climate change. And hopefully we can create a different country here in Britain that can have a more positive impact on the world. And I promised I'd end on a reason to be cheerful. I spent about three years of my life campaigning for a clean power target in the energy bill that just passed. And one of my nemeses at that time was a man called Volkers Beckers. I don't know if any of you have heard of him. He was the chief executive of Empower and one of the staunchest opponents um, of this. Kind of a cartoon villain, fossil fuel pushing, clean power target blocking, tax evading sort of person. <laughs> it's true, it's, uh, it's, yeah. look it up. Um, so you can imagine my surprise last week when I read an interview where he said that the centralised fossil fuel system will soon reach its end. It turns out he's abandoned end power for a role at a renewable energy fund following <laughs> Empire's profits being hit too much by solar power in Germany. <laughs> Citigroup have said that solar will reach grid parity so it will cost just the same as anything else by the end of the decade in many countries. So with even the bad boys of the fossil fuel industry jumping ship, if we work together, hopefully we can turn around the fossil fuel tanker. The wind is blowing in our direction. It just needs a bit of a push. Thank you. Thank you.